So today we've got um, an external seminar kindly given by uh, Mark Drinkwater, who's from European Space Agency's ESTEC uh, uh, base um, in the Netherlands. Um, but his space journey hasn't started there. Um, I've got a few pointers that Mark's kindly prepared for me on um, uh, where he's come from, which will hopefully provide nice context for what he's going to present today. So uh, Mark originally graduated from the University of Cambridge in 1987. Um, he's not noted down what grade he got for his degree, so uh, <laughs> let's not ask uh, too many questions to the coffee and cake later. Um, after that, he uh, joined um, JPL um, in 1987, where he uh, was funded to look at CSAT data, which is a very old uh, satellite now. Um, and maybe we'll see some images of that um, in the presentation today. Um, he also um, worked with um, ASR, um, SARC, uh, radar polarimetry, topics Poseidon, NSCAT, sea winds, quick scat missions. So um, he's worked on really a, a huge range of satellite missions. Um, and he also supported the development of the Alaska SAR facility that maybe some of us that use interferometry will have used in the past. And he worked on developing the McMurdo SAR um, receiving stations in Antarctica, which is great. Um, he helped establish JPL as a centre for polar remote sensing, um, and um, I'm sure we'll see some examples of that in his presentation. Um, but after all of this time um, working in research centres around the world, uh, Mark then joined ESA um, as tech in 2000. Um, and he was appointed there to lead the scientific preparation of the Ocean Earth, Earth, Earth Explorer missions, which included um, the original Cryosat-1, um, Go Chase, Moss and Sentinel-3 missions. Um, and he still works very much um, involved in the science uh, exploitation teams um, with these missions today. Um, the setback with Cryosat-1 when it failed on launch in 2005 was something that uh, is probably very very prominent in his mind, um, uh, but he now leads the scientific preparations for all ESA Earth observation missions, um, which I think, what was it you were saying to me? Um, how many are you preparing 20, at the moment? 20 odd. It's 20 odd missions uh, with about eight or nine new ones in the pipeline and phase AB studies at the moment. Um, so I think um, this is definitely putting um, us in Europe as a leader for Earth observation. Um, all along the way. So thank you very much, Mark, and um, welcome to Leeds. Thanks for welcome, uh, Anna. I, I try and give a perspective from uh, an, an historical view. Uh, I wander a little bit through part of my career, um, both at NASA and since I've been at Europe. I've had the opportunity to be involved in um, exploratory studies with a, a variety of satellite data over the years. And along the way, we've come across some marvelous discoveries. And so I wanted to investigate serendipity in science. Every once in a while, you make a fantastic discovery. And it happens not, maybe it's a matter of fate, but it, it happens for the right reasons. It happens often because you're applying a technique that you didn't use before or you're misusing data for another purpose. And every once in a while, something spectacular uh, pops out of that. And so I'll show you some examples of, of what I would regard as being serendipitous discoveries, uh, which have occurred through the course of my career. Uh, in re either related to my own research or related to missions that we've been preparing at ESA. And the idea is to illustrate that um, public funded space, be it at NASA or uh, the European Space Agency, is actually a fantastic tool for achieving uh, good quality science. Um, you might think that uh, public space uh, with the current trend is under threat though. And this is the thesis that I'll investigate here. Commercial space or new space is, as uh, I'll show you, is, is rapidly changing the way in which we work in space agencies. And this has quite a significant bearing on the course that the European Space Agency might take in the future. You might have heard about something called the FeeLab, which is a new way of being uh, more agile in ESA. FeeLabs to look at small satellites, what we can do with them. But the question I would pose to you, and that's really the thesis underlying what I'm going to present is, does the fact that we focus on new space, uh, smaller, more rapidly implemented spacecraft threaten uh, being able to have uh, discoveries like the ones that I'll show you, uh, and is moving uh, towards, and the trend towards small satellites which are rapidly developed, threatening our ability to do excellent science and good quality science? And does it prevent us from developing instruments that really allow us both technological and scientific breakthrough? And that's, that's the question I would pose to you in the talk today. So serendipity, um, for those who uh, are not familiar with the term, um, let's see if this one's working better. You have to point at this one. It's a favorite word of mine. 
it's, it's kind of on a onomatopoeic. Um, there's something mischievous about it. Um, every once in a while, one of these unexpected, delicious discoveries comes along. Uh, it happens in science every once in a while. Uh, and I would uh, regard this as being that time where you really come across a discovery um, in the data, whether it by use of a tool or other, that, that really changes the face of science. And I'll show you some examples of that um, because at the time, these weren't expected. But if you consider the fate, um, and if you consider the face of science since those discoveries, you'll see that they've helped to revolutionize the way in which we work today. So in reapplying a tool or a method, you often find something unexpected. And I'll show examples uh, of either misuse of technology that's resulted in these, these kind of results, or uh, misuse of a, a technique, it might, whether it be a data processing technique or other. So, <laughs> Uh, maybe you'll come across this randomness of fate at some point in your careers, and maybe something will be discovered as a consequence of what you're doing that ultimately changes the face of science. And that's happened a few times along the way when you look back historically. Uh, and so I start out with um, radar interferometry. Let's see if I can get this going the right way. But uh, I'll show, first of all, some examples of uh, these serendipitous discoveries. Then I'll talk a little bit about what what we would call the, the new space revolution. I have an important perspective on this because I've worked both for NASA and ESA and we have very different ways of working, whether it be a national space agency or a multi-national space agency. Um, we are big bureaucracies. Uh, we like building big things. We like uh, in, in investing hundreds of millions in spacecraft. And the new space revolution is really undermining to a certain extent our philosophy. And so I'll talk about that. Uh, and whether the consequence of that is uh, the expectation uh, of, of whether we have similar kinds of breakthroughs in science in the future. We do have the luxury as an agency in ESA to finance projects of the order of billions. Our satellites are typically of the order of hundreds of millions of euros investment uh, of public money. We want to make sure those are put to the best possible use. Uh, we'd like to think that there's plenty of scope for new discovery uh, with the data that come from those kind of tools. But new space is maybe threatening that to a certain degree uh, with smaller instruments, smaller instrumentation, less capacity. And so I'll look at that a little bit. And the question is whether ultimately uh, we, have a for, we can foresee a, a future for an agency like ESA, which is financed by you uh, and taxpayers' money. So I'll show some examples uh, to illustrate serendipity from uh, the start of, of uh, radar interferometry and how um, this was developed. I spent time at JPL with people who were fundamentally involved in SAR interferometry at the beginning. And we've seen that uh, lead to fantastic revolution in glaciology. Uh, we also uh, got involved in misusing instruments for another purpose and an example of that is use of radar scatterometers they're used to measure wind traditionally but we've used them for imaging in another framework we're looking at uh, new uh, uh, interferometric uh, radiometer data from our soil moisture and ocean salinity mission for those people who are not familiar with SMOS this is giving us access to information over ice sheets that we've never seen before <laughs> and it uh, challenges uh, whether we can use uh, radiometers for looking at temperature and temperature profiles in the ice. We've also got a wonderful example of what we can do with our swarm satellites and how we can use constellations today uh, using multiple satellites for achieving a, a very specific scientific purpose. And then lastly, um, the next step in using SAR interferometry from a tomographic uh, perspective. Uh, many of you might be familiar with tomographic imaging in, in, in medical uh, circles. This is being used uh, uh, through a similar technique uh, with radar data, and we want to probe uh, forests uh, three-dimensionally using tomography in the future. So I'll show an example of that. But first of all, the beginnings of radar interferometry, for those who are not familiar with some of the history, since the 1960s, uh, we've had arrays of radio telescopes out in the desert. This is a couple of examples, one in New Mexico, in Sorocco, and another one in the Atacama Desert. These have both been configured for the same re reasons. Uh, we, the array gives access to what would uh, enable you to have a, a, a synthesized array using the combination of the returns from each of the radio telescopes. You could uh, probe uh, with much higher resolution uh, the sky. And using the combination of the signals uh, and processing the signals 
from each of those and combining them interferometrically, you get the impression of a much larger <laughs> antenna. Now, uh, the ALMA array in, um, in northern Chile, in the Atacama Desert, gives you access to an array which is the equivalent of 10 kilometers diameter, and this gives you much uh, better resolution if, if what you want to do is to stare at the heavens. SAR is really um, derived from this technique. It's about aperture synthesis. It's about combining um, returns from positions of antennas in, in, in a smart way and through processing techniques achieving um, a high resolution picture or obtaining details about the target that you wouldn't otherwise have had access to with one of those antennas alone. And so that's the origin of, 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 of interferometry. And at JPL, where I was working, uh, they were pioneering these principles. Of course, we started out with a satellite with a radar. And what they tried to do, first of all, was to combine the radar data from successive orbits. So we call this single path uh, interferometry. Um, this uses the position of the aperture or the, the radar antenna two different times along a very similar flight track. So you return to the same location on a successive orbit, and you have two positions of the radar. Yeah. And by understanding uh, the precise orbit of the satellite, by monitoring that to within uh, millimeters, uh, knowing uh, the altitude of the orbit and the position of the satellite in space, you can derive uh, the geometry of this triangle and you can understand the position of the surface and its motion over time, depending on whether you successively come back to the same location. So this is the principle of interferometry. And what, would, what was happening when I went to JPL was they were trying to uh, develop uh, the methods for radar interferometry over different targets. Um, the people who I work with, Richard Goldstein and Howard Zebka at JPL, are, are some of the forefathers <coughs> of SAR interferometry. And we've been working on the Ebon data from uh, JPL SAR. I don't know if, uh, if, for those of you who are familiar with JPL tools, they've been flying multi frequency radars on aircraft for many years. And it was on this platform that they pioneered use of. Um, antennas on the aircraft for, for SAR interferometry. One of the early applications was looking at currents. This is the Golden Gate Bridge here, uh, San Francisco. You can see the topography and the interferometric image here, but they were also looking using a long track interferometry at the currents in the bay, in, in the Golden Gate Bay. It was with that that they turned their attention to the RS. You recall back in the 1980s, there were no space-borne SARS at the time. CSAT had failed and we were waiting for ERS-1 to come. The European satellite provided an opportunity to go and test interferometry from a space platform. And so the early work uh, started to use uh, ERS SAR images. And it was at the beginning of the 90s where radar, for, radar interferometry really took off. And over ICE, um, I had a colleague from BAS, um, British Antarctic Survey, Rick Froley. He came and he spent time at JPL doing a sabbatical. And it was at that time where he got together with Dick Goldstein and worked on the first uh, image pairs over Antarctica to see whether you could make radar interferograms over ice. And so that's where radar interferometry of ice began. And it's really had uh, a, a super influence over the discipline. And we'll see how in, in a moment it's transformed um, glaciological studies. So here for the first time, they were able to combine pairs of images. At the time, ERS-1 was flying in a very special orbit. It revisited the same place at three daily intervals. And what they tried to do was to look at the successive images and to, to combine them to see if there was coherence still between the scenes. It turned out that on three and six day intervals, they could still see coherence in the scenes. And it was with the com combination of those data that they were able to uh, get this first image of fringes and an interferogram over the Rutford ice stream. This shows you uh, pictorially um, the uh, the ice stream location, you can see the margins of the ice stream. You see the ice flowing uh, in a stream with its sheer margins where the, uh, the fringes, where, where you see decorrelation and the fringes disappear. You can see topography on either side of the ice stream. And you see the ice flowing um, across the grounding line. You can see the fringes are, are more widely spaced here. The ice is flowing slowly. And now all of a sudden it, it, it becomes ungrounded and the ice accelerates. This was the first evidence uh, in space-borne SAR data of the possibility of using interferometry to uh, monitor the motion of the ice. And it's using that tool now uh, that we're able to do things more routinely. I had the, I had the privilege of working with um, 
most of the space agencies in the world who have SAR data join the International Polar Year to achieve the first map of ice velocity over the entire ice sheet. This was constructed by design. We had uh, several space agencies flying SARS that contributed to this. It's comprised of data from ERS-2, uh, the PALSAR instrument on, on uh, the Japanese uh, satellite ALOS, uh, from the Radarsat-1 satellite, from the Radarsat-2 satellite, and from MBSAT. And each of the space agencies pooled their resources to acquire interferometric pairs of images and to combine the data so that we could get the first ever seamless uh, velocity map of Antarctica. And so tens of thousands of images went into this. But the most phenomenal thing about this is that because SARS are traditionally right looking, under all normal circumstances, you would end up with a black hole here. It's, it's the zone of non-visibility for right looking SARS. And that's because they're all some synchronous orbiting instruments looking to one side. Under normal circumstances, we wouldn't be able to get data here. But by doing orbital gymnastics of the radar sat satellite, they slewed the satellite around to look in exactly the opposite direction than normal. And we were able to fill in the hole uh, to fill that polar gap. That's given us access for the first time as a, of a seamless map of the ice velocity. Well, today it's become more uh, routine. We now have access to Sentinel-1, uh, two satellites counter-rotating, imaging um, all parts of the globe every six days. This gives us routine access to velocities, whereas this took <coughs> years to put together. We're now doing this on uh, a weekly basis and getting six daily mapping and we're able to put together a seamless chart of ice velocity uh, based upon this SAR interferometric uh, tool. Um, and it's really revolutionizing uh, the way in which we can do glaciology. So if you look at how uh, we've progressed historically since 2011, we've had access to a few satellites capable of interferometry. This is Terrasar X. This is a German satellite that's specifically designed for the purpose. But you can see that we were only able to get sat samples every so often, periodically, here, uh, one sample in 2011. Things became more frequently uh, towards the later part of uh, 2014. But as soon as Sentinel-1 came online, and as soon as we had two satellites in orbit, we're now able to get an unbelievable density of measurements of ice stream and ice stream flow. This is uh, samples uh, along the Piedmont Glacier. This is the flow line along the glacier. You can see the velocities along the glacier uh, midline. And this shows the sampling of the, the velocity at different points along this line. So the colored points here refer to different locations along the center line of the glacier. And you can see the velocities at those locations in time and how they're varying. You can see seasonal variability in the velocity. You can see the velocity go up and down at certain times. And it's clear that with uh, Copernicus now, we have insight into time variability and ice processes like uh, we never had access to before and so on. Copernicus is now transforming how we can use radar interferometry over, over the ice. So I switch attention uh, briefly then to, to another serendipitous discovery. So that was how you apply radar interferometry to, to, to ice and how it's become a practical tool for everyday use. Um, this is another one example. If we go back historically to the beginning of the ERS-1 mission, we didn't have uh, mass memory on satellites. We couldn't store all this fantastic wealth and volume of data. We were wrestling with the fact that you could only obtain images in certain locations around the world. It's become routine now to dump all the data and you get terabytes a day. In those days, it was megabytes and it was postage stamps of images here and there where you really wanted to obtain your SAR image. And the only other way you could do it was to have receiving stations. And Anna said uh, that our endeavor at the beginning of year S1 was to put receiving stations in as many high latitude places in the world as possible, because that was the only way we could access the data from the satellite. You couldn't record it and then downlink it when you fly over your receiving station. So you had to find a way of directly downlinking the data as you were measuring it within one of these receiving station circles within range of the station, and you could acquire uh, data from the SAR and you could directly downlink it and we were sending ships back uh, with uh, high density tapes from these locations to recover the information and that's the way it worked. Today it's routine. You trans transmit, the satellite via sat uh, transmit the data via satellite and we get the data back within a few hours. Uh, it was a lot more painful in those days to access data in Antarctica and for those of you who remember as well, the SAR was part of a, 
a mode of operation of the active microwave instrument. When it wasn't in sound mode, it was in scatterometer mode. And so you had a choice to make whether you were, wanted to make a star image or whether you wanted to measure wind over the ocean. It turned out that in Antarctica, without these receiving stations there all the time, we had to abuse the scatterometer mode of the active microwave instrument to make images because we simply couldn't access SAR data in Antarctica. So we decided to start using the scatterometer imaging as a means of obtaining data on a weekly basis of Antarctica. And this is the first example of uh, one of the scatterometer images that we put together to get an, an impression of the total ice cover. Uh, this is an, a, an image that's made by accumulating all the orbits over several days. We can see a lot of variability outside the ice edge, and I'll come back to that in a moment. We'll see if my movie works in the, in the next chart. But a little bit of description, first of all, about what we're looking at. So for those who are not familiar with, with ice, the scatterometer is a radar which is looking off to the side. Here uh, we form images at about 40 degrees incidence angle. So the radar is looking off to the side. And you can imagine if the surface is uh, smooth, like a, a mirror, the radar wave bounces away from the satellite. Um, that's what we call a specular reflection, and that's typical of open water or very thin, flat ice. When the ice is, has been scrunched together or, or ridged or forced together, uh, we see uh, roughness elements on the surface. And in those cases, the, 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 the roughness reflects the, or scatters the radar wave back to, uh, to the satellite. And those surfaces would appear bright, and these surfaces would appear dark. It turns out that multi-rice, or ice that's been around for several years, uh, has lost a lot of its uh, salinity, and the radar wave can also penetrate inside the ice. And in those instances, we have volume scattering from bubbles uh, that are present inside the old ice. It turns out that the old ice also has a, a, a unique signature. And if you look at these types of ice, they have a very specific impact in terms of the, the range of backscatter or the amplitude of the signal coming back from the surface. So the bright locations, you'll see uh, icebergs and ice shelves. Ice shelves happen to be some of the brightest targets in the universe at C-band. This is a C-band uh, radar with a wavelength about five centimeters. And so the ice shelves, uh, the floating ice shelves appear very, very bright and icebergs you see are very bright points in the data. The very dark areas are very young ice and the intermediate gray tones are, are the old ice. So if I, if I refer to an example then of these, the, the, the advantage of having this was that we're able to um, start to put images together on a routine basis. And this was revolutionary because it's the first time we, we could see uh, seasonal and interannual variations in the ice pack. Uh, you can see the old ice, which is relatively brighter, uh, moving around the Arctic. Uh, and you can see the circulation, uh, which is carrying uh, the old ice out of the Arctic basin into the Fram Strait. You can see the summer period where melting is taking place and when wetness is on the surface of the ice, it becomes darker. And so the seasonal and annual variability could be charted for the first time using this combination of radar data and the more traditional data, which most of you are used to looking at uh, when you look at these climate reports about the minimum of sea ice in the Arctic. The traditional passive microwave data is good at giving you the extent and the concentration of the ice. Uh, but the radar has some complementary information about the structure and about the types of ice in the Arctic. As we progress to uh, new scatterometers, you can see we're able to sharpen the images much more. This is now QuickScat satellite. This is a KU band scatterometer. This gave us access to uh, much higher resolution data. And you can see much better discrimination between the old ice. This is multi-year ice now, which has survived several years in the Arctic. And this is seasonal ice, which is relatively dark. I played the movie back again. You can see the Beaufort Gyre uh, and its cyclonic circulation, twisting uh, the old ice in the Arctic. And you can see uh, the old ice uh, being swept out through the Fram Strait between Spitsbergen and Greenland into the North Atlantic. So the scatterometer became uh, a, a, a very useful tool. And together with the passive microwave, we now have the possibility of accessing information on uh, the old ice area in the Arctic. This would tell us how much old ice, old thick ice is, is staying in the Arctic. And the passive microwave would tell us 
the extent of the ice and the concentration of that ice. And using that, we could start to build up information about the volume of the ice in the Arctic. We can also track the information much the same way as SAR interferometry. And now, um, routinely, uh, we have uh, used pairs of, of, of images spaced at uh, 10 intervals of days uh, to obtain a view of the circulation in the Arctic. And this shows a vector product, which is being hosted by uh, UMETSAT now. It's a routine operational product, and this is being used in operational forecasting models. We can also use these products to look at how long the ice survived in the Arctic, and this gives us uh, a measure of the ice age, if you can track the ice over the successive uh, periods uh, throughout the season from one year to the next. And this allows us to quantify the age of the ice in the Arctic and, and how climate's impacting um, uh, the volume uh, of, of old ice. And it's this data which are complementary now to our Cryosat satellite. I, I, I'm not going to show any results from Cryosat today, but I wanted to give a flavor of some of the complementary sources of information. This is one place you can turn to, to to find out about the age of ice in the Arctic. These products are all uh, commonly available for anybody who wants to access them. Um, some of the, uh, the projects that I've been involved in at JPL have, have resulted in the National Ice Center in the US using these data and generating these data routinely. You'll find uh, METOP data or QuickScat data dating back uh, decades on their uh, web server. And you also find uh, the ice age products that come from the scatterometer and the passive microwave on the uh, ocean and sea ice staff, which is the facility that UMETSAT have to host uh, these kind of products. So that's uh, misuse of scatterometers. Um, now I turn attention to, to seeing beneath the surface. Uh, seeing beneath the surface has been an obsession of remote sensing and, and NASA and, and ESA for the last 20 years. And, that's the main reason, it's the primary reason why we've gone from um, easy to uh, develop small antennas at high frequencies to more difficult and more challenging to develop large antennas which give us access to low frequencies. You need a much bigger antenna to operate at L-band. Um, and so the shuttle imaging radar was the first opportunity to, to use a large L-band antenna. And it showed us some dramatic uh, features over the desert sand. CSAT had not <coughs> flown long enough to, to yield these kind of results. And it was in the early 80s that they discovered that the radar would penetrate uh, some meters beneath the surface of dry sand. And this gives access to, to information about river valleys beneath, uh, beneath the desert sand. This spawned a whole new area of uh, study, uh, what, what might be called space archaeology. And there were people who were uh, working at JPL on use of uh, those shuttle imaging radar data to peer beneath the desert sand. And they were making a search for uh, this lost city of Uba, which is in Saudi Arabia, uh, beneath the Rub al, -Al uh, uh desert. And this was um, well known for its frankincense uh, trade. And you can see in the multi-frequency polarimetric SAR data here, you can see some of the old trade routes that focused on uh, the, the lost city of Ubar. Uh, and so long wavelength SAR data became immediately uh, useful for people who wanted to look, uh, particularly in desert reason, regions, for, um, for cities and remains uh, beneath the sand. So seeing beneath the surface um, yielded a whole new area of enterprise. And this is the next example I show you, because we come back to this interferometry example that I showed at the beginning. The use of um, aperture synthesis has also been exploited for our SMOS satellite. And for those who are not familiar, this is the soil moisture and ocean salinity satellite. And it's got a surprising resemblance to uh, the radio an antenna array uh, in the desert in Sirocco, New Mexico. And it's not surprising because we employed uh, the same methodology. Each one of these patches along the antenna uh, results in 69 independent radiometers, and we synthesize those 69 independent radiometers uh, in an interferometric way to yield the equivalent of a, an eight meter antenna. This is what gives us access to um, 10 to 20 kilometer resolution on the ground, and we're using that to measure at L band um, about this wavelength um, the, uh, the soil moisture and the salinity of the ocean. But it's another use of this that I wanted to show you because uh, this is also a serendipitous uh, discovery. 
we started using SMOS for the cryosphere. And that's one of my favorite domains, as you can tell. Um, but first of all, a bit of details about, about SMOS. SMOS has been flying since 2009, so we now have uh, quite some years of experience with the L-band radiometer. Uh, we've been uh, measuring uh, brightness temperature um, at L-band, and it gives us complete coverage of the Earth every three days. And so we have the opportunity to map large areas of the globe. And for soil moisture and ocean salinity, that's fantastic. But you can imagine uh, over the poles where the orbits uh, cross, uh, in those lake locations, we have fantastic time and space resolution of the data. And it's that reason why we turned our attention to the polar regions. So here's an example of a SMOS image that many of you prob probably haven't seen before. Um, this shows uh, the typical uh, SMOS image over Antarctica. This is an annual mean. Uh, it's an annual mean showing the brightness temperature uh, which is TB here, the brightness temperature range from 175 kelvins to 255 kelvins. L-band uh, radiometer data in Antarctica are a function of uh, the emissivity and the physical temperature. And so we started to look at these data and we, we, get, we get confused by some of the features we can see. Some areas um, appear cold, okay, it's the coldest part of Antarctica, so maybe that's self-explanatory, but when we look in more detail, I'll, I'll explain it gets a little bit counterintuitive. Some places where it's warm appear cold. And this is also counterintuitive. So that uh, prompted us to go and look in a little bit more detail. Now we know there are places in Antarctica where there are large lakes. And so we wanted to try and understand the sensitivity at L-band to penetration to the ice sheet. And this is the interesting part is most of the theory uh, at L-band um, tells us that we have uh, a minimum in the absorption of ice. Um, so if you look at uh, what's called the complex permittivity of, of, of the ice, you find that at L-band, uh, you have a real part of the permittivity about 1.5, which is density dependent, and you have a, an imaginary part, which is about 10 to the minus four. That's what theory teaches you. Well, most of the theories for the absorption, or this E prime prime, um, are approximate fits to measurements made in the laboratory. Um, and it's my uh, presumption that the, those fits uh, largely overestimate the loss in the ice. The loss in the ice uh, determines the absorption of thermal microwave emission coming from depth. And so you can imagine that if the absorption is much lower, that you could see uh, microwave emission from much deeper inside the ice. Well. If we have the ability to see microwave radiation originating deeper in the ice, then we have the possibility for uh, sensing, using the temperature, the, the thermal profile within the ice. Now, it's every glaciologist's dream to, to understand the impact that the internal temperature of the ice sheet has on ice flow. And so what we'd like to do is thermometry of the ice sheet. And the question is whether you can apply these longer wavelengths as a way of sounding the ice sheet in much the same way as we sound the atmosphere. If you think about our METOP satellite, we have a multi-frequency microwave radiometer. It, 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 it uses um, multiple frequencies for looking deeper and deeper and deeper into the atmosphere. Uh, because of atmospheric moisture, you have absorption in the atmosphere and using a longer and longer wavelength, you can see deeper and deeper and deeper into the troposphere. Using those principles, we, we, um, we derive a sounding capability in the atmosphere, and this gives us access to temperature and humidity, which goes into everyday numerical weather forecasting. And the METOP satellites in the future will carry this kind of sounder. Well, you can imagine applying the same principle here. If we could go to longer and longer wavelengths, we can see deeper and deeper into the ice sheet. Um, using that, we can sense, we can window different depths within the ice and try and translate uh, the radiative temperature uh, as observed into uh, into a temperature of depth. If we could do that, when we can look at the profile. So we, we go for some well-known locations where, where we look at features along uh, a line. And here we show a, re a relationship between the depth of the ice, shown in the blue dots, and uh, the SMOS data, which show an anti-correlation. And the first thing we notice is that there's a very strong correlation between the radiation uh, as observed by the L-band radiometer and the ice properties. And if we model the ice properties, we can see uh, uh, the depths uh, of, of, of the profile in, in, in the location where Lake Vostok is. And we can see how uh, the temperature profile is influenced by uh, the subglacial topography 
and by the location of, of things like Lake Vostok. And so if we zoom in uh, on that area, and we also stretch the brightness temperature range now, you can see very clearly sensitivity to Lake Vostok. Now, Lake Vostok's at a kilometer and a half depth. If you look at the relative transfer theory, uh, you would wonder why is L band emission coming from one and a half kilometers depth? And why you, have you even got any sensitivity to that? Well, it's my presumption that uh, there's a lot we still have to learn about um, the complex permittivity of ice. Um, but there's clearly sensitivity uh, to uh, the depth profile here. And these are large, uh, th this is the oral basin, and we see the locations Dome C here. This is where the deep ice core, the Epica ice core, was drilled for the reason that you could retrieve the longest ice core, or what they thought would be the deepest and oldest ice core at the time. You see Lake Vostok here, and you can see other areas where we have uh, topographic lows in the, in the bedrock, and where we have some of the thickest ice in Antarctica. Well, we've tried to model the sensitivity um, of the temperature to the ice thickness so that we can try and retrieve the thermal profile within the ice. And we've looked at the sensitivity to, to variation in seasonal temperature at the surface as well. We can see that there's a very strong depth dependence in the temperature profile in the ice. This is the steady state temperature profile in an ice sheet. And if we could um, have a variety of frequencies for sensing the, the, the relative temperature, then maybe we can retrieve the profile. Well. We've had some success uh, in trying to model two tri transects here from Dome C, where the Concordia station is, across Lake uh, Vostok, and a different transect here. Using these transects, we've tried to model from the SMOS measurements uh, the variability in the temperature. And we've had quite some success in trying to, mod to, mo uh, to model the, the relative profile. And so there's some hope uh, for doing thermometry of ice using L bands or longer wavelengths in the future. And uh, this gives me some confidence that we are sensitive to temperatures as deep as a kilometer or a kilometer and a half in the ice sheet. And I'd like that we can investigate this in the future. And so um, I helped a US college to develop a new program uh, within the instrument incubator program. They've developed an airborne instrument and they've been testing it in Antarctica. I've helped them at the Concordia station to mount it on the tower. Um, we're flying an instrument in Greenland at the moment, and there's even a proposal for Earth Explorer mission that's based around a wideband radiometer, which will sweep uh, frequencies from L-band all the way down to megahertz. This will give us access to deeper and deeper inside the ice, and hopefully using that and this retrieval scheme we're talking about here, we can think about doing sounding of temperature in ice in the future. And that's a very tantalizing prospect because together with the interferometry, as we showed, saw before, examples, that, that will give us access to another holy grail, if you like, of the glaciological community, which will us, tell us about the temperature dependency of um, the parameters of the ice so that we can better develop our flow models. So that's uh, thermometry of ice. Now, one of the last, last two examples I'll show is SWARM and the magnetic field mission we've got. This was ESA's first foray into um, constellations of satellites. Until, until this point, we'd only ever had single satellites. And um, this gave us the opportunity to look at how you could combine different orbits of satellites uh, to improve the sampling, in this case, of the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, here we had a, a four-year mission um, with the combination of, of three satellites to try and do the most comprehensive mapping, not only of the main uh, characteristics of the magnetic field, but they wanted to look at the time variability in the magnetic field. Uh, the mission was launched on uh, in November two, 2013, and the satellite has been uh, returning data of, of fantastic quality since. How many people here working on swarm data? Is there anybody in the room? Anybody? Yeah. Good. So I, I'm happy I included this example then. Um, swarms doing a fantastic uh, job of helping to, to, to revolutionize the science here. This is the typical product, of course, um, which is the, the, main, uh, the main product of, of, of uh, the magnetic field. And here you can see uh, the typical pattern of the Earth's magnetic field. We see the strong uh, poles, and we can also see uh, the South Atlantic anomaly. But this is, um, this is the magnitude of the field of um, 20,000 to 60,000 Tesla. And the reason why I sh showed this is, by contrast, what I'm going to show you in the example that follows is 
is like hunting for a needle, a needle in a haystack because what we're trying to do now is to look at time variability superposed onto this main magnetic field, which comes from things like ocean circulation. If you think about ocean circulation for a moment, um, oceans being conductive can induce a secondary uh, magnetic field. And if we can look for that variability in this very, very large signal, if we can dig that small signal out, then maybe we can, uh, we can map uh, tides. So ocean currents, uh, which move within the Earth's magnetic field, they induce a secondary field, uh, both poloidal and toroidal. You see a representation of those toroidal and, and poloidal fields. And this gives components of these secondary fields, which, which distort the main magnetic field. And using this three satellite array, as the satellites are, are rotating around the Earth, we try and sense this additional component uh, of the variability in the field. Now, this is a, a, a unique observable. Um, and if we, could, uh, if we could use this signal, then we can model the barotropic tides uh, using the magnetic field component that we observe. So colleagues have been uh, trying to retrieve uh, this, um, this tidal arrangement by looking at the variability in the data. And they've had some success now in, in retrieving the principal uh, lunar sem semi-diagonal tide. Uh, this is a 12, approximately 12 hour uh, tide. And here you see uh, the tides rotating around the ocean basins. And the most important uh, thing to point out here is, this is uh, plus or minus uh, two nanoteslas. This is uh, 10,000th of the size of the field, uh, the main magnetic field uh, of the Earth. And so this is really uh, an amazing uh, discovery in the data. This, this, uh, this would suggest that we can also use uh, swarm data in the future to help us parameterize uh, barotropic tide models. And it's an independent source of information that we never thought we would have access to before. And so this is another uh, lovely discovery in the swarm data, which was unforeseen. Uh, and last example is tomography I wanted to show you before we, we talk about new space briefly. Um, CT, uh, I don't know if anybody's had a CT scan. Have you ever laid inside one of these things while it hums around you? It's quite noisy. Uh, images are formed at different, uh, in different geometries as the thing goes around you, and you can reconstruct a three-dimensional picture of, of the inside of your body. Well, if we can apply tomography uh, to, other, uh, to other types of geophysical target, then obviously it's beneficial to, to understand the 3D uh, structures within. Well, we started doing that uh, with our biomass mission. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this new P-band uh, imaging SAR, uh, which we're currently developing at ESA. This is a long wavelength SAR. It's a UHF uh, frequency uh, SAR. And uh, this will enable to penetrate, as I was mentioning before, even deeper into the surface. And this allows us to access uh, information about biomass in uh, tropical rainforests. And we've chosen the longest possible wavelength because um, L-band data or C-band data are absorbed in very dense uh, tropical rainforests and uh, this will allow us to access uh, the amount of uh, woody biomass in the tropical rainforest to give us a much better idea of the standing stock of carbon in the rainforest. So we're going to fly this mission in 2022 and we want to test uh, out our approach for uh, tomographic imaging. We've designed the orbit to uh, repeat very closely within certain intervals of time uh, on a monthly basis. And using this um, series of different baselines or positions of the orbit in space, we're going to do tomographic retrievals um, of the forest biomass. We've been testing out this technique uh, using airborne systems in Africa. This shows um, the FSAR system, which is flown by DLR. We've been flying this system together with NASA, which had the Elvis uh, instrument. Uh, it's Elvis is, is providing um, a laser scanning capability, and that tells us about the tree heights. Uh, the FSAR system has a range of frequencies, P-band, C-band, X-band. Um, we can generate your typical traditional uh, image of the tropical rainforest here, um, and we can compare that with the tree heights and the tree density as well. The traditional parametric SAR interferometry would uh, combine is, uh, information from two passes over the forest, and that would give us information about uh, the forest canopy height and density. But the nice thing about um, the multiple baseline uh, configuration we have here is it'll tell us about forest height, forest density, and it, it'll tell us also about the structural uh, 
uh, information about the, where the biomass is in, in, in the tree canopy. So we've been using the laser data to understand where the returns are coming from in the forest uh, and verifying uh, that the interferometric retrievals of the tree height uh, are correct. And we've also been um, looking at the laser data here by comparison to uh, the different uh, frequency retrievals of the, uh, of the forest density and tree height. And we've been combining the information in tomograms in much the same way as the, the CT scan that I showed you before <coughs> to retrieve vertical structural information about the forest. And this will be the first time uh, we've had a radar capable of telling us about the 3D structure in the densest part of the tropical rainforest. And this will give us much better insight into the standing stocks of carbon <coughs> and how forest uh, clear cutting is having an impact on, uh, on the standing stock of carbon and also uh, emissions of CO2. Um, the less uh, forest you have, the less drawdown you have, and the more ends up in the atmosphere. And so monitoring tropical biomass is, is the focus of this mission. Uh, and tomography is going to be the means of really uh, developing the information about that. So those are some of my examples. Um, um, before I turn my attention at the end here to, to new space, I was telling about uh, the new space revolution. And I introduced that as perhaps threatening the very existence of, of public space. Well, all of you saw the launch, uh, I think, of SpaceX uh, replayed on the TV a, a week ago, I think. It captured the imagination, perhaps not for the right reasons, because he launched a car into space. But um, what Elon Musk has done is to transform the nature of the business with commercial launches. It's, um, it's providing an opportunity for people to launch satellites which don't have big public funding. And um, this has had a, an important impact, particularly on the commercialization um, of space in America. And it's also having quite a threatening impact uh, from our perspective because we have public funded big rocket development and that's what keeps the European Space Agency enterprise alive. Without launches, you know where, um, and access to space has always been the most fundamental thing. So new space and private investment is changing the face of our business and this really um, has an impact on what we're doing. And I'll come to some examples about uh, new space in a, in, in a moment. The question that I would pose to you is whether um, we can expect the taxpayers to invest in, in something like the European Space Agency in the future. And the other question is whether uh, using uh, these small satellites that they're likely to develop, develop is there uh, any likelihood of uh, these fantastic uh, scientific discoveries in the future? So here's an example <laughs> of uh, Elon's uh, Tesla Roadster in space. You can go there and you can find a webcam image of uh, this guy in space now after he launched uh, his favorite vehicle. But um, companies like Planet are, are developing a uh, similar capability as us. Um, they're doing this on the basis of rather cheap instrumentation. And the question is uh, whether this uh, is going to undermine what we're doing. Um, Planet uh, Lab, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Planet Lab. Does anybody use Planet Lab images? Traditionally, uh, optical data, uh, everything down to around um, half a meter spatial resolution. They claim to be able to access a lot of the globe on a daily basis. They have hundreds of satellites um, from which to access optical images, and they have satellites that they can train on a particular location. This gives you strategic uh, intelligence information about targets that you might want to track. And it's providing a, a commercial uh, business case. Um, Planet has 175 doves. Uh, they're CubeSats. They're three, uh, three or four AU. Uh, satellites typically about this big. Um, they're combined with Rapid Eye, which is a slightly larger uh, satellite. It's, it's what we call a micro satellite. It's typically of the order of this size. And then they have uh, SkySats as well. These give us access to, to global observations. And one of the typical things that Planet Labs is doing is they're monitoring coal reserves, they're monitoring um, port activity, they're monitoring um, piles of iron ore. They know how big the pile of iron ore is so that they know how the economics uh, are influencing steel production, construction, and economic growth. And this is all strategically valuable information. Uh, at the same time, uh, we've got a company called Spire. Uh, they develop CubeSat-based um, AIS. Uh, it's a vessel recognition system used by shipping. Today, VHF 
is the main way of tracking ships, but we only have shore-based um, stations for receipt of the VHF signal. Ships, ships in the Arctic or somewhere like that uh, can't be tracked. And so the idea is to use uh, polar orbiting CubeSats uh, with, equipped with this VHF uh, receiving capability to be able to track where vessels are. Uh, Spire are already making a commercial case for this, and they're augmenting it after the, the, the loss of uh, some uh, commercial aircraft over the last few years. Uh, they're also augmenting it to track uh, the ADS signal. ADS is one of the beacons that transmits where aircraft are, and the FAA have uh, regulated that you have to send the signal now at least every 15 minutes so that aircraft can be tracked around the world. You can see that some companies have a, a reason to want to develop this knowledge. It, it provides a commercial case, but it also provides information about traffic flows around the world, product movement, uh, economic fortunes at different airports, and you can see that that's of uh, extremely uh, high value uh, from a commercial standpoint. But there's one thing which really influences, and this is one thing that really influences what we do. And now, um, the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration in the US has commissioned Spire to deliver meteorological data from CubeSats. And this is, starts to get really interesting because public space has financed large weather satellites to deliver information of top quality for MET forecasts for years. And this threatens the, the model by which ESA operates because um, you imagine now that a national weather service can turn to a commercial provider rather than a sole source like ESA or UMETSAT for meteorological data. If they go to the cheapest bidder of uh, radio occultation data, then maybe um, those countries uh, would prefer the cheaper option and not necessarily the highest fidelity option in the future. So this threatens our, our business to a certain extent. And so we're watching very carefully how these commercial operators are developing their business case. There's another one, operational ice monitoring. Uh, ice I, I don't know if, uh, if you're aware. First time that one of these small satellite enterprises have gone beyond optical data. They've launched an X-band SAR instrument. It's performing very well. And it's now going to be delivering operational ice information. And this is exactly what we do with Sentinel-1, uh, which is a Copernicus satellite that we develop on behalf of uh, the European Union. So this is another place uh, that threatens our business. And then lastly, we, we're, we're participating with some smaller member states in developing hyperspectral imaging capacity. And this is a serial sized box instrument that can fly also on a CubeSat, it's low power. It has uh, high fidelity optics. Uh, but you can package that in a very small satellite, and you can imagine that that could also undermine some of the things that we're doing at ESA. So new space abounds. Um, you can see a lot of commercial enterprise trying to make a business case out of developing these things. And the question is whether we can sustain uh, business in, in, in an agency like ESA in the future uh, with these kind of opportunities being offered by commercial providers. So here's an example of what you can do with these data. This is some of those half meter resolution data. This is studying a site in China where they're developing a huge array, uh, solar, solar power array. Um, and over the space of a year, you can see the development of these sites using the type of information that uh, we have access to. I'll just uh, show that again. You, see, you can see um, the images over time and the development of some of the arrays. You can see that the Planet Labs, in this particular case, have access to information which is extremely valuable. It tells about power generation in China. You can use the same philosophy for monitoring agriculture, looking at uh, you know, forecasting the yield. Uh, you can think about using it to monitor, um, you can buy shares in futures because you know what the yield of, of a certain crop might be. You can use it for all kinds of economic benefit. and. Um, and so this is really revolutionizing where, 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 is the, where are the benefits from, uh, from space applications. So in the future, can, can, we, can, can we foresee uh, future discoveries uh, when we're under the pressure uh, that we're under from companies who are offering these microsatellites? And, and I wonder whether there's a place for an agency like ESA in the future, uh, which is public funded. Um, Copernicus, of course, offers uh, many possibilities with free and open data. And uh, the repetitivity of data uh, and the access 
the routine data uh, from Copernicus is already there. And so um, I would expect that Copernicus also allows us to, to, to compete against uh, these small satellite companies. And so this new revolution of, of, of data from Copernicus is, is a fantastic opportunity for us to, uh, in Europe, uh, set the bar with respect to high fidelity, good quality, repetitive information. Um, and for those of you who are not already uh, on the Sentinel hub, uh, you've got access to Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 optical data, Sentinel-3 optical data, and uh, more recently Sentinel-5 precursor atmospheric uh, composition data. These are regular routine repetitive information and they're all free and open to everybody. And so uh, Copernicus is, is helping to drive this revolution in space and, and it's really the future of the agency for ESA. Um, we've launched um, a number of these satellites already, of, of course, but this is really what, it, what it's all about. Um, geospatial analysis um, and the use of remote sense, satellite-based remote sensing data um, has, has reached new heights in terms of commercial enterprise. And we can see uh, mar market valuation of use of Copernicus um, is up at in, in, in the billions of dollars. And it's no wonder that the commercial companies are interested in playing the game. Um, we've estimated that if you, if you buy an ice cream a year, uh, you get 10 ice creams back in terms of uh, value from the data. And Copernicus has to uh, build this argument so that um, a public funded enterprise like ours can survive in the future. I think Copernicus has a lot to offer by comparison to these commercial uh, companies. And this is really uh, where ESA is placing a lot of its uh, eggs, uh, or this is a place where, where we really uh, want to uh, command uh, the market. So I made some comparisons uh, before I close. So the difference between mature, uh, mature or public space on the right and what we would call the adolescent new space on the left, New space largely uses off-the-shelf technology. It's well-proven sensor technology. They have to be small packages, so they are um, often have less capability. They're often of poorer fidelity, although that's changing very rapidly, I have to say. Um, the future benefits um, likely going to come from combinations of use of, of satellites that are tasked um, in, in arrays. The satellites will be talking to one another. They'll be telling uh, one satellite we're telling another there's a ship here you need to image that ship when you fly over and so the satellites will be communicating with one another in the future um, by comparison um, our public space is is really tuned to research and development building instruments that uh, couldn't be realized without the combination of our member states uh, investments and what we're about by comparison we're all about high fidelity instruments that can yield um, scientific discoveries like I've shown you. Um, we're trying to replace our big monolithic satellites by intelligent, more agile craft. Uh, but the future is to put these together into a combination of uh, instrumentation capabilities like Copernicus that give us access to fantastic science as well as public benefits in the future. And so I close um, with this. I, I, I've had the good fortune to have been involved in, in the space business for 30 years. It's changing today at such a rate uh, like we've never seen before. And um, there's fantastic discoveries around the corner. The, I think the examples I've shown uh, illustrate that the, the Explorer technologies that we're developing at ESA also yield fantastic science. And there's a lot of information in there that's been untouched yet. Um, and this will drive discovery in the future. Um, we are under threat from new space. We have to pay attention to this, but we are. We're monitoring it very carefully. Um, but I think Copernicus is really um, a flagship that we can be proud of, uh, proud of. Over the last few years, Copernicus has really changed the perception of, of what ESA is all about. And I hope we can continue to add to Copernicus in the future. There are many opportunities that exist with, uh, with Copernicus and our Earth Explorer program for the future. And so I, I hope uh, for those of you who are using our data that you uh, come across some fantastic discoveries in the future. It's just around the corner. Thanks very much for listening.